Welcome back. This will be a direct continuation from the previous video, where I was implementing all the front-end code for our Lambda authorizers. In this video, I've gone ahead and moved all the code from version 5.3 of this application into the backend folder inside of my current serverless jams service. Now you can do the same thing, but I suggest you follow along with me to notice some of the differences between the versions of the code. Now, inside of the backend folder, there shouldn't be any changes to the get song vote count file or the record song vote file. Those should basically act identically to how they were acting before in previous versions. However, there are pretty significant changes in the auth.py file, it's completely new, the get token file, it's also completely new, and the verify token file. There's also a few separate changes below, where I've included a package.json file that you should copy from the code for this section, and make sure that it has serverless finch and serverless Python requirements inside of it. Then make sure that you're actually npm installing both serverless finch if you haven't already in the previous videos, and serverless Python requirements, which will be required to handle the Python requirements for this application's auth section. Now you also need to make sure this requirements.txt file is included locally because we'll be working with the requests library and the Python Jose library in our authorization section. Now after that's all done, let's take a look at the serverless.yml file because there's a few differences here too. I've included the auth domain and the auth0 API ID inside of the serverless.yml file so I can load them as environment variables inside of my backend functions. Now, if you forgot what these values should be, you can check your frontend code because they're already in authconfig.json. Just copy the audience value and the domain value from inside of there and make sure you include them inside of serverless.yml in the environment variable section with this exact lettering here. Now, if you need a template for how to do this, just look at the code in 5.3 as it shows you what this should approximately look like. Now, there's more changes in serverless.yml towards the middle here. Inside of the middle, I'm going to be adding an auth function. And this auth function will be getting the auth from the handler inside the backend folder in the auth.py file and the handler function inside of that. This function is then going to be put in front of the record song vote function and that API endpoint to authorize any requests coming into it with bearer tokens. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But in order to configure this, we need to add this authorizer to the record song vote function and make sure that we're referring to the auth function right there. Now, once we've done that, that's the main change to the function section here. But if we keep scrolling down, we need to make a few more changes to the plugin sections to add serverless Python requirements, and also to add this section underneath the custom to configure Python requirements to use Dockerize pip non-Linux, in my case. Depending on your operating system environment, you might need to learn how to package Python dependencies up, or you might want to end up changing my code and using something like Node if you don't want to use Python but Python acts as a pretty standard example of how to actually use this authorizer in order to sit in front of these functions. So once you're done with that, I also included a package section here, which is gonna exclude things like node modules from being bundled alongside our function code. The same thing with excluding the frontend directory and package lock.json, which can get pretty big from being alongside these functions when they're deployed. I'm just trying to save space and not have our deployments take a long time. So once you've made those changes to serverless.yml and you've added requirements.txt and the package.json file here, you should be good to go after you've installed those dependencies too. Now I'm not gonna install the Python dependencies locally. I'm just gonna run them all up in the cloud and if anything fails, we'll debug it inside of the serverless dashboard. So let's go ahead and take a look at all these files that I moved over. Let's minimize the front end section because we're basically done with that beyond having to deploy it in just a moment. Let's start with auth.py. Inside of here, we're working with the operating system library here in order to get the variables loaded from the operating system like the auth0 domain. We're also working with the requests library to later on make HTTP requests inside of our code. And finally, we're relying on these two other files, get token and verify token, in order to get the token from the incoming event, which you'll see right here happening on line 13. And then after we've confirmed it looks like what a token should look like, having a bare section at the very top, a space, and then three separate pieces of gibberish essentially separated by periods, equivalent to what you might see if we went over to our front end here. And once we're actually done with the login, and the login with Google process, then we can go in here and use the 
function that is const id token equals await auth zero dot get token silently and if we take a look at what that id token looks like this is exactly what we would expect coming in next to that bearer inside of our code so this is really just verifying that that's exactly what it looks like and if it doesn't look like that it's going to raise an unauthorized exception here and prevent anybody from using that api if it does look correct, it's going to send this auth token back over to auth.py. And the next step will happen inside of this verify token function inside of verify token. Now, what this is doing, if we scroll to the very top, is it's going to do some similar things, loading in environment variables and libraries that it requires, like the URL open function here, which is similar to requests in that it's going to go and allow us to get data from a HTTP URL. But it's also going to load in Jose from Python Jose and the JWT portion of that library to help us work with JSON web tokens. It'll do things like getting the unverified header of a token, which is the very first part of this three-part token. And we can test this out if we copy this token, go over to a site like jwt.io and look at what this header here looks like. Once we've done that, we can go back to our code here and let's see what's actually happening. This JSON URL variable here is going to be the result of getting a value from this HTTPS endpoint here. So let's take a look at what this looks like inside of our browser. Now, if I go to fmcserverless.auth0.com and paste in the rest of this URL here, this is about what it'll look like. It'll look like a key ID here that could match what's inside of our uh, token that we were just looking at inside of this section. So if we go back over to jwt.io and I go back a few times to confirm what's in there, let's take a look at what was inside of our header that first time. I'm gonna copy this token again pasted in JWT. So let's put that in there. And this key KID is a key identifier. And it's just trying to make sure I'm using the right key in order to verify and decode the token uh, properly. And if we match what's here inside of the public key with this public key ID, and in the background inside of our actual code, we're going to look at what the token is from this unverified header. And in our actual code, we'll look at what the key ID is inside of this unverified header and compare it to what we see inside of the actual key ID for our JSON URL that we loaded. Now, this is the public key that we can show everyone to make sure that we're using the right key that we're working with. Now, once we're done with this, we'll go ahead and set up an RSA key here and just make sure that we have one to use to validate the JWT. Now, when this RSA key exists, it's going to be used later on inside of this JWT decode function. And this means that we're going to try and decode the JSON web token from how you saw it in this JSON web token website here to what it looks like on the right side here. The only difference is we're going to do a two-part thing. We're going to decode it, but when we're using JWT and Python Jose, it's also going to verify the contents of the token and make sure that they are actually validated against Auth0. It's going to do this by having this issuer domain, having the Auth0 audience or the API ID loaded in here, and it's going to confirm versus the algorithms that we set when we created this API. And it has this token, of course, coming in to be validated against. Now, if we're not sure what the algorithm should be, we can go back into Auth0 and compare them to the algorithms that we set up on our API when we created it. In this case, RS256. So with that all set up, it's just going to let us know if something fails. It's either going to return the payload to us if everything goes successfully, or it's going to say there's an expired signature or a claims error or some exception that I couldn't possibly predict. And it's in any of these cases going to return unauthorized and prevent people from using the API. So what happens after this in auth.py? Well, at this stage, we know this ID token is a decoded verified token. So we can use it in the rest of our code and assume its contents are accurate. But what we can also do is check for user info about this user, because Auth0 gives us a handy domain to do this. Now, the way this is constructed is by adding a slash user info to your Auth0 domain, and then you send in a bearer token alongside that as an authorizer to get information about that user. So let's try this inside of Postman right now. Let's go ahead and go over to this section that I have set up here. And if I delete this previous token, let's try sending a request. It's not going to happen because it's not authorized. But if we use the token that we have from our front end, hopefully this is still valid. We can paste this in here in the token section, remove any new lines that we might have inadvertently copied, and then hit send. 
and you'll see we get a bunch of information about this user. Now, one thing that I think could be useful for us right now is it tells us whether or not the email is verified. And for a first step, this could be a reasonable way to determine whether or not somebody can vote. So let's go back in here and confirm that we're already doing that in our code. So if we have an ID token, meaning that we have a verified ID token, and the user info email verified is equal to true in this case, this means that we're going to go ahead and proceed creating a policy that grants access to whoever is calling this API to work against the method ARN of that API. Now what this generate policy function does is essentially generates an IAM or identity and access management policy for AWS to say whether or not the principal, in this case, whatever user we're working with inside this API, can take an action to invoke the API that is contained within the resource. Now this resource comes in from the method ARN, which just comes in from the event request, but you don't need to know too much about that other than this generate policy is gonna help us a little bit later on to deal with permissions as well. But now that this whole process is concluded and it looks like everything's set up correctly, we really just need to clear the screen here and then run serverless deploy. Now that we've saved all the requirements and the serverless.yml changes, along with all these new changes to the backend, this should help us make sure everything's working properly. Now back over here in the section with this post here, if I wanna remove this and hit enter, and let's go ahead and hit enter there, this is currently saying we're unauthorized to take this action on the vote endpoint. So even though we have our body formatted correctly to say song name is Coderitis, if we keep hitting this send button, it's not working. Well, if we go back to the authorization section, and instead of having no bearer token, we make sure that this is finished deploying, and then we copy this token from our front end that we just generated into the bearer token section and remove that new line if I haven't done that. I can hit send here and let's see what happens now. Now it looks like we've successfully recorded a new vote. And if we keep hitting send here, we still are able to vote multiple times, which is a problem we could address later on. But this means that we can actually only vote when we're signed into the application and our email is verified. If we wanted to test this a different way, we could go log out of the application, log into it, and let's go ahead and create a new account. Let's use this at test at test.com. Now, I don't have this email, so there's going to be no way I can verify this. And I'm going to add some of these requirements here and then sign up. And let's go ahead and check this box. In this case, this is because we still have localhost set up here. Now, let's run the same code we were running earlier to get that bearer token. Let's go ahead and get that token silently, console log the ID token, copy this whole thing here, and go back. And let's replace that previous user token with this one, remove that space there, and then hit enter. Now, it looks like this user is not authorized to access this resource with an explicit deny. Now, the reason this is happening is because this user hasn't verified their email yet. That means that this is working exactly as we intended, and we could change things around later on to determine access based on a user's email verification. But in future videos, we'll take a look at another way of how to actually authorize people's actions with APIs using something called scopes. So congratulations. Now all you need to do is run serverless, client deploy to push the front end of that application out into the cloud. You're also going to need to say yes, just to make sure you're overriding everything in the bucket. Then remember to go back into your browser, sign into AWS and go to CloudFront. Inside of CloudFront, go to that CloudFront distribution for this particular website and create an invalidation. In my case, I'm going to use slash star to invalidate everything. And once we've done this, we should be able to go from our localhost application to our serverlessjams.com website that's actually hosted for anybody to see. And this should be able to work. I'm going to log out here because I think it was still keeping my tokens around. And let's log back in. In my case, I'll log in with Google one more time. And now let's really try and vote using the UI. And if this fails, I'll need to make sure I hard refresh the page before I do this, log in, and then I can try voting for Coderitis again. Now that I've done this, it looks like it's successfully working in our production application. So congratulations, by now you've implemented everything in order to have a protected API endpoint with some validation on the back end, both for authentication, that a user is who they say they are, and authorization, that there is some criteria that they need to meet, like an email being verified before they're allowed to actually take some action. 
Now, in future videos, we'll take a look at how to do a little bit more with authorization to develop some more expansive sets of permissions. So hopefully, I'll see you there.